happy to have a special guest next to me, Rabbi. He released an album last year which was highly praised under his name, Morphosis. So give it up. Warm welcome. So your album was uh, called What Have We Learned? So what have we learned? I, I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm constantly searching. So Is that what the title is about? Yeah, it, I think it, uh, I called it like this at the time. It was the time I was moving out from Italy and I wanted to put a settle point from my life timeline where I can say, okay, until now, what have I learned and what I experienced? Yeah. And I'm sure you have experienced quite a lot in the music world. I mean, you've been around for more than 20 years. Yeah. Being busy as a club promoter, running a record label, producing music, being a DJ, being a producer. So you've basically covered it all. You grew up in Lebanon, so um, it's not the typical place where you get exposed to techno music. Lebanon is kind of a bridge between the East and the West. So you have, you always have influences from the West. And uh, this is what happened to me in my childhood, actually. But in your childhood, there was a civil war going on, right? Exactly. I mean, that must have been quite intense, living there. It, and you don't really was. go to a record shop like I did when I was a kid and yeah. listening to tunes. I mean, it wasn't really that easy. No, at all. Uh, actually, it was... Uh, music was a bit um, a side thing when you live in, in this kind of situation. But also through music you find a relief or a way to also to go on if you find it. I mean, also people found other things. It was difficult to get material from outside because no importers were sending records and stuff. But we had some tapes arriving through people that were passing through or sending them or something. So you think that um, because it was so rare that it made you appreciate the music much more as exactly. well? Exactly. I really do remember my first cassette when I was a kid. And which, it was which really tune important. was on there? Michael Jackson Thriller. <laughs> <laughs> that was really amazing for me. Okay. And then uh, Samantha Fox. I don't know if you know her. Yeah. It was not it was for the cover. Actually. The teenage yeah. wet dream. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that arrived to, to Lebanon, so that was cool. So do you have any key elements when you produce? Let's for example say you have an, an a tune that inspires you and you say you don't replicate the sound, but what drives you to then start a track? Normally nothing drives me to start a track. I just plug and play. That's my I I do it very rarely as well, so I, it it kind of has to be good because I I don't have like lots of time to produce music, but I have accumulated um, lots of experiences with musicians and on stage and also like stage managing and plugging and tech writers and all this. This helped me a lot to be more free in my production and also in my performances. Which were the first pieces of equipment that you plugged and played with? I started with the S950, the Akai sampler. Okay. It was probably in 98. A friend of mine had it and then I took mine and then I sold it after, after a bit. If you would describe yourself, are you more a producer? Are you more a DJ? Are you more a label owner? What's the most important for you? I think I'm a bit hybrid thing of no good of all these. Like... <laughs> I'm not really a good musician, I'm not really a good DJ. Like, uh, come not, on, you're too humble super. with yourself. For me, it, all these are the same thing. It's mm -hmm. uh, the way I DJ is the same way I, I perform on stage or I produce the music. I really love to improvise and play with records that are not really made for DJs. Mm -hmm. I like to mix up many things together, but then of course, uh, the main thing in all these three is mining the audience and, and, and delivering for the dance floor and the people. Did you go through different phases where you said, okay, now I've been DJing for five years, now I'm going to start a record label, and after doing that for five years, you said, okay, I'm, now I'm going to start producing, or was it all going side by side? I never decide. I'm not like, okay, I'm, I do this for a year, and then 
I want to change or I want to do this forever. So you're not that much of a planning person, it just happens? Zero plan. <laughs> I'm really bad at it. But you at least had the plan to move to Berlin and it now worked out, so you're, you're living yeah. here. <laughs> For now. Congratulations. Yeah. I yeah, hope thanks. you don't mind the cold weather. Um, but no, I'm, I'm happy about it actually. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But when you're in front of, you say, I want to make a track, but you're sitting down and all of a sudden you think, how am I going to start? Do you sometimes have those moments where you don't know? Most of the times. What do you do to come over that? I just try. And if it doesn't work, I stop or I start over with another thing. I don't force it. And this is a key thing for me. I just, I know that not every time that I'm doing something is going to be working properly. So being an improviser also in this... So I just give it the time it needs. I mean, sometimes you plan a song and you work properly on searching for the sounds you want, for the, for the groove you want, or this kind of like, yeah, I want to do a house track which has this, this, and this. And then you do it and it doesn't mean anything. And then one day, yeah, okay, I'm going to just plug this new thing I just bought or... I just warm the machines and then you come out with something that's totally wicked. Mm -hmm. Or you change your setup for some reason. Or you have a new pedal. Normally this inspires me a lot. What's your setup now? Uh, it's ever changing. Now I have um, an 808, a Pro One, a Poly 800, I just bought it, I'm modifying it. Echo Tiger organ, mm -hmm. Duo. Double, the double organ. I just bought also a new mixer here in Berlin for, for to start the new setup. So you use external equipment, hardware, and you also yeah. for sequencing? For recording, I record on a, on a computer. Mm -hmm. yeah. You also do live shows as well. So yeah. which kind of equipment do you take on the road with you? I normally have for, for live shows, I kind of always have my 808. And if I can bring the synthesizers, I bring them with me. Otherwise, I, I ask for them on the Tech Rider. And it's often a, a mono analog mono synth and a poly synth. Both okay. analog, not model analog. Yeah, exactly for this reason that I always ask for some synthesizers when I have like a far uh, gig that's, that requires like a, a far flight. Is they, it because you got charged too much overweight by the airlines? Also because the oh, machines back. are very no, they're very weak. You can't bring everything with your hand luggage. Like the 808, you can like put it in a hand luggage and you're okay. But then an MS20 or a Pro One, you cannot put it like easily in. When when you check so, in the check in okay. luggage, yeah, an analog modular synthesizer and sequencer. It's actually four sequencers with four voices with infinity infinite ways of patching mm -hmm. since it's modular and I did the whole design of the thing and uh, we worked with the technician that's building it on the projects and we're starting to build it now. And is it only going to be for your own personal life sets or is it going to be for sale as well? It's made for my life sets but then of course if we find out that it's really good, interesting, we can, we can make a very few things because it's really all made uh, by hand, it's soldiered, it's lots of work. I can hear the, the atmosphere that you were talking about. It was only just to say what is a jam on instruments without being repetitive in a way. This is a whole construction on four uh, analog sequ sequencers and all guided by the MPC with converters, uh, a Pro One, um, MS-10, and all recorded on a four tracks cassette. So you loop that also back into the cassette player just to keep that warm? Actually, I used it because it was a, a very um, particular one. The Tascam Porta Studio 414. Um, 
it has an internal distortion that you can use from passing from the line and mic signal and it has a fader on it so i used it for the distortion as well so when you produce music how at what percentage do you have a dance floor in mind uh, kind of never but uh, i like to give this feeling to the tracks not but you sometimes also have the feeling that you have to please somebody with your music yeah Always. I don't make music for myself. I don't do it for myself. I do it for the people. And then this is absolutely the message. This is why I like people to dance to the music I do, even if there's no kick drum or hi-hats. So what defines a, um, a magic moment for you in a club when you do a live set? Only when people are dancing or is there something else? No, when they're really into what you are doing and in the, at the, and dancing at the same time. They're like really attentive on what you are doing and they're looking at you and or the things that you are doing and they still dance. That's, they still that's dance. really nice. How meta strange yeah. the music may be. Exactly. Do you sometimes push the people to, okay. <laughs> yes. Sorry for that, but yeah. <laughs> I, uh, it's, it's when you get the confidence because they're really there looking at you and they're enjoying it. That's where I just say, okay, now I want to see how far you want to go with it. And I really like it. Some, of course, it's, it's not a universal thing. So probably some people don't like this, but. Pushing I, limits is a big. Yeah, I, I kind of want to give this message when I perform okay. live. Yeah. You brought us an excerpt from your live set as well. Yeah, it's uh, track three. number three. On the number CD. three, Tony. Bring it on. Also, this is just like an example of how I try to uh, build the same thing that I do in studio on stage, totally improvised and not prepared. Um, this is uh, one of the few times that I synchronize one thing with another, but in a in a very basic way, and uh, yeah, I I like the idea of this floating detune thing. I just discovered it on the recording, and I said, it's gonna be lovely. Great. And you're thinking about releasing it as well? I told you this in the year. Uh, not on the <laughs> mic. Any advice you can give to young producers? Tons of them, it depends on what they want to hear or listen to or what, but just one thing, ma many people ask me how do I get my sound on how, how do I get my tracks sounding like this or arranged like this. Um, it's just a simple thing, it's, it's freedom in music. Probably uh, I always avoid to go into a grid and lock it inside there. So this is probably my main thing. I just keep it free and no matter what, what comes out, no matter the frequencies and the sounds, don't care about it. Just the feeling that comes out from the tracks mm -hmm. and don't lock music. This is my... No boundaries. Yeah, no boundaries and no imprisonment. Because many people try to um, follow a style or... Uh, an inspiration for them, which is another techno producer probably, or rock or electronic or whatever. And they try to do exactly the same thing. And this is the biggest mistake in my opinion. Just like be yourself free and don't lock yourself into a genre or into something. Do whatever you want to do and it will come out eventually. If, you're, if it's written somewhere, it's going to come out. Thank you, Thank you for being here.